Thanks for tuning in to this Thanksgiving edition of Playbook ATS podcast. You can catch this on the new ProLine TV YouTube channel. And uh, you're also uh, able to watch, uh, we basically have cut it, uh, NFL college football videos. We've put that still on the uh, Playbook Experts YouTube channel. So if, if you want to hang out there, please still remain there because we have not yet received 1,000 subscribers. It's still our goal by the end of the year to get 1,000 subscribers on the Playbook Experts YouTube channel. But we also want to send you over to ProLine TV because that's where uh, we are going to be starting a, a really fun, new, entertaining, and informative, uh, an informative channel uh, where we're going to have just wall-to-wall sports handicapping, general sports talk, and much more, uh, including by this gentleman, Jim Feist. How's it going, Jim? I'm doing good. And what would you call that? that? Like a gaming, a gaming type of portal for really good information that that from qualified cap. Is that what you like call that ProLine TV thing? Okay. Well, you know, we got to be. We have to be a little bit um, careful with the word gaming, though. Even though we can use it, uh, because oh. they've kind of ha- uh, uh, sabotaged the word. Where gaming now uh, is just considered. You know, everybody, you know, playing, uh, what would it oh, be? Oh, I see. You know, play, I see playing what you mean. games, actually. Right, right, right. On, there is uh, that on video. So, yeah, I'm a little you, Yeah, you're that. right. You're, you're right. It's it's used for different But the, line, yeah. the, the definition does uh, does work. We'll just call it, we'll just call it gambling. Which well, is now okay to use as a word since it's been legalized. It is. Yes, it is. Yeah, Mark, it, was, it avoids I, any I confusion. Was, I wasn't thinking about that because it's legal so many places now. I wasn't even thinking it was a problem anymore. You know. But I know I know when we were thinking of putting a name together for one of our shows, uh, and Mark, uh, who of course Mark Lawrence not here, as you know, if you were watching last week, he's got the week off. Uh, he's still working feverishly to put the uh, newsletter together before Thanksgiving. So and I think to- he may be trying to catch a turkey running around his backyard. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, by the way, that, that was the, that was the funniest Sports Center commercial I think in history. It's probably about twenty years ago with uh, John Randall chasing around a chicken dressed in a Brett Favre uniform. <laughs> <laughs> the good old days, ESPN. Right. Uh, yeah. So, Mark, unfortunately, or fortunately for his sake, not here. Uh, so, we will definitely uh, look forward to seeing him again next week after his uh, Thanksgiving week off. Uh, but yeah, I was talking to Mark about putting something together for one of our shows, one of our uh, new shows we were doing, and we were thinking of a title, and uh, somebody was thinking of using the word gambling, like gambling podcast. And Mark was like, no, I, I, I don't want to use gambling. Gambling's not a, not, not because he was being old school, uh, but I guess the word is still... Uh, even though everybody can say gambling in a conversation, I just don't know if putting gambling to brand your 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 name, to brand your company gambling is is I don't know. I, I kind of agree with Mark. I'm not sure that that's something that is. I don't think we're there yet. I don't know. What You're you probably think. right. So what would you call like sports wagering? Or I was gonna say sports and in, yeah. sports investing. I mean, oh, yeah, cool. those are the that. things that we were thinking about. Yeah, handicapping, you name it. That's why it. Uh, maybe we'll get there. I'm sure we will. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think I think the trademark should be Lexley Campbell. Just go. <laughs> oh, I like that. Go for it, it, and it really is. It is absolutely. Yeah. You hope to so, end up on the right side. That's it. So what we're going to do on this show uh, is we're going to uh, tackle uh, college football in the NFL. Our game of the week in college football is going to be Texas at Texas A and M. Uh, probably the biggest game of the weekend because the winner is in the SEC championship game. Uh, the loser might be out of the playoffs altogether. Uh, we know Texas A&M would be. Texas A&M actually might not even make it if they get to the SEC championship game and lose it. And that's part of our discussion in the first segment. We're going to go over the different scenarios uh, and, uh, and how it all would play out. And we're going to take a look at last night's updated uh, rankings release uh, NFL, we'll talk about Pittsburgh Cincinnati as our game of the week. Of course, it's a huge game for the Bengals. They could save their season. Uh, with that one, and that's, of course, uh, a big AFC North battle. Uh, we'll have our high five segment where uh, these gentlemen will put together their best picks in 60 seconds or less. And then uh, we'll take a look at the uh, viewer comments. 
uh, and everything else going on behind the scenes here at Playbook Experts and Proline TV. So let's go ahead and get started. I tell you what, before we get started, um, I know we're going to get into college football, but Andy, you mentioned this just a couple of minutes ago. Go ahead and, uh, and, and tell us what's going on with the Survivor Contest. Okay, well, as uh, listeners, viewers might uh, recall, there's 14,266 entries that began the season, and um, 14,212 of them have been eliminated uh, for a, a winner-take-all or winner-split-all, depending upon if there's a tie, $14,266,000. Heading into last week, there were 99 hmm. entries still alive, 33 of them were eliminated with the Commanders, who lost uh, at home to Dallas. Eight were eliminated with the Houston Texans, who uh, lost against the uh, Titans. Three were eliminated uh, on Thursday when Cleveland defeated the Pittsburgh Steelers. And one, sadly, was eliminated because they forgot to turn in a pick. Oh, and uh, that's uh, very costly <laughs> because going into last week, okay, when there were 99 <laughs> entries alive, the implied value... 4 million, 14, 266, 000, divided by the remaining number of entries of 99 said that each entry had a theoretical value of 144,000 plus. Well, with one third of that 99, uh, now uh, more than one third, about half of it, almost 45 being eliminated, the 54 contestants, those entries are worth $264,185. That's on a $1,000 investment. So that's a pretty good return right now. Wow. I don't know that uh, there will be any discussions, any group discussions as far as perhaps uh, not splitting it, but uh, well, possibly splitting, not quite yet. But I know that there have been some uh, individuals who may have sold a share of their entry to someone else, which is different than shopping it because just you sit, you sell a share. It, it doesn't mean you win anything, but if they end up splitting, uh, then that entry gets split, whoever not, whoever has ownership interest in that. So it's getting exciting. Now, of course, this is a two-week uh, portion of the contest, meaning that the uh, 54 entrants who remain alive have to submit a selection on one of the eight teams playing Thursday and Friday, the three Thanksgiving Day games and then the Black Friday game. If they are successful, they then have to hit submit another entry for the uh, uh, 24 teams that are playing Sunday and Monday. So the, the regular season lasts 18 weeks. The contest season could last as many as 20 weeks uh, with two of the weeks this week and Christmas week being those two weeks where they split the number, where they split the games and you have to make two selections. Uh, the Christmas uh, day uh, games, I think it's, one on Wednesday, two on Thursday. That's a six team. That's a very short week that could thin, uh, th th thin out the field even more. And of course, that was all part of the strategy when people were planning out uh, their routes to uh, uh, going 20 and 0, which is what it would take to guarantee yourself all or part of the prize uh, when they made the selections. And of course, as uh, many viewers and listeners remember, uh, the, the vast majority of the field was eliminated in the first month of the season, beginning with that opening week where Cincinnati lost at home as big favorites to uh, uh, to the uh, New England Patriots. So, Andy, what Andy, what would happen if if somebody had used all eight teams that are playing the next two days? And um, you couldn't, you couldn't, and you couldn't then they're put out. an entry in. Yeah, they would. That's, they would yeah. be out. Yeah. So, really? in fact, that's that's the one thing that I because I you know I do proxying, so I tell everyone be aware of the rules for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Make sure I if there are eight teams playing on Thanksgiving, I say make sure you have. In the best possible scenario, at least three of those teams remaining, okay, for the four games, for the eight teams that are playing. But also keep in mind, I think it's Kansas City and Chicago. There were two of them, or maybe, yeah, I think it's Kansas City and Chicago who are playing in Christmas. In fact, it is because I think Christmas, uh, I forget who Kansas City is playing. I think they may be playing uh, maybe Pittsburgh. I know Chicago is, I believe, playing Seattle. Uh, so in plotting out your strategy, I remind people, be very aware of those teams. And I think we sort of talked about it uh, a few weeks ago. And that is, we know that at the start of the season, there are going to be six teams that will not meet up, live up to expectations that we had in August and probably another six teams that will, that will exceed expectations. Teams like, for example, Washington get off to a quick start uh, Denver right now in the middle of the season. So if you were able to use some of those teams earlier, uh, that uh, uh, that you did not expect to fare well, that actually hurts you because, you know, if you if you were taking a look at this Monday night's game between Cleveland and Denver at the start of the season, you'd probably think, you know what, Cleveland might be a pretty good selection. 
well, now they're not, and Denver would be the selection. So uh, a lot of sharp people who were able to anticipate the surprise teams on the positive side probably save them for the situation where they're going to be needed. Because remember, if you go 20-0, and 0, that means there will have been 20 teams that you used, but also 12 that you didn't use. And if some of those uh, 12 teams were teams that we thought, like, like for example, the Bengals, Okay, then uh, then you got away with or you will have gotten away so far with not having to use a team that we expected to be good. And maybe we'll see if a team like the Bengals or the Rams or the Dolphins, especially make a nice late season run and are still available for some of the contestants. All right. We'll have a link in the description. Andy, uh, matter of fact, email me that link because I want to make sure that we uh, provide that for anybody that wants to uh, track. Uh, the contest. Sure. So well, yeah, you can go right to Cir- you can go right to circusports.com and there are two main things there. The Circa Millions entry and it says, you know, for more information click here and the Circa Survivor entry for more information out there and it gives you a week by week tally of what's available plus links to show who everybody still has available, the 54 contestants, what teams they still have not okay. used. Wow. All wow. right. Very cool. Now let's uh, turn our attention to college football. We'll get back to the NFL in a little bit. Uh, And uh, last night, the uh, latest rankings reveal for the 12-team college football uh, playoffs uh, came out. And, uh, you know, we're still one big week away, and and two officially, of course, because we have to get through the championship games. Uh, But – so a lot of things can happen. There's still be some big upsets coming up this weekend. I could change everything. So uh, this is the bracket. And uh, we'll start, first of all, uh, as you can see, you know, right now, Boise has taken over that four spot for a second straight week. So they're ranked ahead of the top Big 12 teams, which right now is Arizona State. But there's a four-way tie in the Big 12. So anything can happen. Uh, right now, and but that's Arizona. Arizona. Doesn't Arizona State clinches it, clinches its spot with all they have to do is beat Arizona this week. Well, yeah. Well, the bottom line is, is uh, it doesn't look like any Big Twelve team is going to get in unless they win the championship, though. So maybe yeah. they can, but uh, right now that doesn't look like the, the case. So Arizona State, Iowa State, BYU, and Colorado, those are the four teams uh, that will have a shot at the Big Twelve championship. Arizona State and Iowa State have the best chances uh, if you go through all the tiebreakers. Uh, BYU has a legitimate chance. Uh, they just need just a little bit of help. But bottom line is they need a couple teams to lose, and uh, we'll see if that works out. So um, anyway, what a great story, though, isn't it, seeing Arizona State on the board for the playoffs? I mean, just where they were a couple of years ago. That program was dead. Uh, Herm Edwards, I don't know what he did with the program, but it wasn't good. Uh, and this Dillingham young coach, one of the youngest coaches in college football has done a tremendous job. So he probably won't be there very long. Uh, if he keeps it up, they got this really exciting running back, this scataboo kid, uh, which is going to be an NFL running back. He's, uh, he's not, 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 uh, gentle, don't get me wrong, but you know, he'll, he's a pro. He's somebody that you're going to hear about in the NFL. Um, anyway, it's a great story. Uh, anything, uh, did, 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 well, any of you guys, uh, have a prediction on what you think, uh, is going to happen in the big 12. Who do you feel more confident will come out of there to win the championship in those four teams? I, I like Arizona state. I've been on them. They, they are unbeaten at home this year. Uh, that this, cause this game is on the road, but, uh, you talked about Dillingham. He'll, he'll be a hot commodity after this season. Took over a team that was left in disarray. They went three and nine in his first year as they inherited a team that lacked a lot of talent, lost some to the portal. They've already won nine games this year. It's one thing to double your win total from a year before. It's another thing to triple it with one game left, possibly two. What do you think about Tony? I mean, I'm in agreement that ASU has the best shot. Uh, BYU actually will know when they take the field because they take the field last on Saturday. Uh, whether they have a chance or not. Farmageddon is going to be good. Uh, Iowa State, I think, has been really flirting with disaster. For uh, you know, they, they almost lost to UCF. Arizona State almost lost to UCF. So the Big 12 has been really as, as expected, wide open. Uh, so I, I'm not going to say, well, they definitely deserve a spot no matter what in this uh, CFP. I think it's been open enough without a dominant team that if they do have a 
you know, a three loss champion, I could see them getting knocked out. Uh, but yeah, certainly I think it would be exciting to see BYU go into that final game of uh, Saturday night, the final power four kickoff of the evening with an opportunity. But again, they would need Kansas State to beat uh, Iowa State. I think Arizona State beats Arizona rather easily. Arizona's got great skill players, but their big issue all year has been uh, protection up front. Just haven't been able to protect Fifita, and and that has really broken down their offense. They really can't get pressure either, so I don't think they're going to be able to stop Arizona State's uh, run game. Scadaboo reminds me of that kid Schrader from uh, Missouri. Very similar. Yeah, story. Uh, I similar. think he's better though. I think he's. I think he he'll is, but very, you know, a, a battering ram of a running back. Yeah. Definitely think he's yep. got a, a, an NFL future like Carson Steele. Uh, and then um, Colorado. I mean, look, they they fumbled away their chance. I thought Dion phrased that perfectly. Just could not stop the run. Uh, and uh, you know, Kansas, to their credit, was physical enough on defense to uh, to win that game. I think CU does win their finale. So uh, you know, they would then need both BYU and uh, Iowa State to lose. So Arizona keep State, it, I think, chalk, they get in, and then we'll see what happens at the other spot. Yeah, keep in mind the preseason favorites. There are four of them that you could argue. Utah, Oklahoma State, Kansas, and Kansas State. Kansas State started out playing well, but they've not been all that sharp lately. Kansas is the team that's hot. And, mm -hmm. by the way, they were 3-6. and six. They knocked off those a uh, uh, couple of those upsets. They win this week. All of a sudden, they, they become bowl eligible. No, nothing as far as the CFP is concerned, but it'd be a nice job done by Leipold after uh, they disappointed early. Yeah, very. I mean, they blew a bunch of games in the fourth quarter early in the season. I mean, a, a lot was expected from them. You mentioned Oklahoma State. This would be their first winless season since, uh, and this is going way back, since Mike Gundy was a first-year offensive coordinator. So we're, we're, we're talking 30 years. Uh, you you so, mean non 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 winning season, not not like winless no, in the conference. Uh, winless conference season. Oh, okay, because it'd also be his first losing season since I think his first year as head coach, which is yeah. But years. I'm just talking about going zero and eight. I mean, they, they haven't beaten anybody, uh, and he's gotten in it with their fan base. It's been it's been a rough year for the Cowboys. Yeah, I actually uh, I think Oklahoma State might actually uh, pull off the upset. Uh, I think if you're looking for a couple of Nice double-digit upset picks. That's not a bad one because now Colorado's coming off a loss, uh, so they got to be thinking something. You know, maybe the pressure. They're at home, and Oklahoma State finally found uh, a quarterback that works the system well because they have this redshirt freshman quarterback that got his first start last week. If you were wondering why they put up forty-eight points, that's why. Ollie Gordon, who's done nothing all year, uh, a lot of that also has to do with the fact that teams were stacking the line of scrimmage. And they couldn't do anything about it because they didn't have a dual threat quarterback. So everybody was on Ollie Gordon. Well, now you put a dual threat in there, you got to pick and choose. And that's why the offense had an explosion last week. Ollie Gordon finally had a big game. So I think that could continue. And if this Smith kid, the quarterback, has another good game, uh, you might see especially because they'd like to get a win, just like you guys mentioned. So uh, this is their season. This is it for Colorado. That, that, that's why, and I want to ask Victor this, my first thought on the game, over the total. Yeah, it's absolutely, five, absolutely, that's, that's definitely five. leaning that way. You're right, uh, definitely. Kansas is at three upset uh, underdog wins in a row now for the Jayhawks, playing as well yeah. as almost any other team in that conference. Aside, and by from the, the way, uh, I believe Sun last Devils. week, I believe last week in uh, Mark's newsletter, he pointed out what you do when an underdog is off uh, three straight wins. And uh, last week, the play was uh, Baylor. I think Baylor ended up winning, so it didn't work then. But now, interestingly or ironically enough, coming off those three straight underdogs wins, that's where Kansas plays at uh, at Baylor this week. Yeah, and Kansas needs the win for ball eligibility. <laughs> Baylor still has a little bit of hope because the tiebreakers in the Big 12 are just by the thousands. Uh, and they're one of those teams outside the, the top four I mentioned that still could win the championship or get to the championship game. Uh, but Kansas definitely needs the game more. Uh, and then uh, overall, though, I mean, that is definitely going to be the, uh, one of the key games, too, uh, to keep an eye on. But um, I don't know. We'll see, see how it all works out. Again, that's what the fun is about the Big 12. Anything could happen. Uh, and then right there, you see they would uh, the Big 12 winner has Ohio State, uh, and then the winner would play on Bo uh, Boise State. How interesting that would be if it really worked out that way. Where Because let's feel this. I mean, you've got Boise State 
just a game away from the semis. So if by some miracle you had an Arizona State upset of Ohio State, uh, one of those two teams would be in the semis. Don't think that's going to happen. But uh, Ohio State, Boise State, uh, that would still be a very interesting situation because uh, Boise State uh, would end up with the home field. And I think that could make a little bit of a difference. So, well, first of all, Boise has to get by Oregon State. They probably will. They do. And then a like a, a possible I'll say a likely rematch, and this would be on their home field against UNLV, who they beat yep. by five earlier this season. Well, what do you think? I mean, because we've been talking a lot about Tulane, and unfortunately, I mean, their ranking is still very low. I'm uh, surprisingly, uh, I don't know, like they're 20 or something, maybe even worse than that. Uh, so they're really far down. Uh, so they're not getting any near the respect that Boise State's getting. Uh, but if Boise State does lose, it's going to open up the door for Tulane now, who's already in the AAC championship game. How about so, that? How about SMU? Wouldn't SMU and Tulane possibly play? SMU might have almost. No, SMU is in the uh, ACC, of course. ACC, so. no. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I was thinking about the possible yeah. matchup. Which, which really yeah, would have, Tulane's uh, got Army. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, that's so Tulane said. and Army. Yeah. Uh, in that situation, you got to believe the way Army got blown out last week that, uh, well, I don't know. You tell me. If Boise State loses an Army and the winner of Army, Tulane, and the AEC, uh, do you think – first of all, do you think UNLV gets into the picture, or do you think they go with the winner Army, uh, Tulane? Or stick I with Boise? with the winner Army, Tulane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yes. what I would think. Yeah. Okay. So if Boise loses, the winner Army Tulane uh, takes over the group of five uh, slot. Okay, sounds good. Uh, now it's taking a look at Indiana. All right, so Indiana gets blown out by Ohio State, yet they're still in the playoff picture. It is their thanks, only thanks wall. to Oklahoma and uh, uh, yeah. Florida. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. and so, I, I have no problem with that because look, again, everybody wants to harp on Indiana you know, and their lack of quality wins. That was a 7-7 game with two minutes to go before the special teams got involved. Uh, and again, Hoosiers scored first. They could, w- w- once Ohio State got its pass rush going and got up two touchdowns, it was a wrap. But the fact is the game was 7-7 at the horseshoe. They didn't They didn't embarrass themselves. So uh, if, if you win out, if you're the Hoosiers, I think, especially given the carnage in the SEC and the Big 12, uh, to me, they, they, they deserve a, a top 12 spot. Would you, would you think perhaps needing style points that you might want to play on both Penn State and Indiana? Penn State's in a lot better position, but you never know what the committee might do. Uh, so they may want to get as many style points as possible. And they're laying a big number against Maryland, as is and Indiana's leading in the big number against one in 10 Purdue in their, in their what's that, the open bucket? Andy, bl- blanket style points this week. So anybody you want to ask me about style points, I say, yes, they need them. Uh, and, by the and, way, and yes, they should take them. Yes, you, don't know if, you don't know if these committee members are actually watching these games and not just looking at the score. Nobody wants to see these matchups right here. Nobody wants to start the playoffs with conference games. Nobody. Yeah. I mean, I mean we don't want to see that. So hopefully it'll work itself out. Uh, all right. So here's the scenario. Okay. And, 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 and Kiffin actually brought this up himself last week before the loss. So Penn State. All right. If you're Penn State, do you rather play in the championship game, somehow get in there, and risk losing it? That might put yourself in jeopardy of making the playoffs or not. Or would you rather just, like Lane Kiffin said, Hey, I don't want anything to do with the championship game. It's going to cost me maybe a chance to go to the playoffs. Therefore, if that is the way coaches are thinking, shouldn't we just nix this whole championship formula? Because if if the coaches would rather not play in it because they think it might hurt their chances of getting into the playoffs, well, it's, it just ruins the whole idea of a championship game, doesn't it? I, I mean, I'm, I'm in agreement there, but that's a separate conversation. Just in general, I think there's there's too much money in conference championship games for them to go away. You know, the, the, the venues are predetermined. People plan on being there to support the conference. It's a money maker for whatever city they're in. People bid on those sites. So I don't think they're going away. It would, it would be awesome, Greg, in a perfect world to have just the regular season championship 
uh, be a regular season champion be recognized as the conference champion because that would make even more uh, it, it would lend more credence to the, this regular season schedule. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're always going to have a conference championship game. Yeah, the they're, they're they're remedy. That, it, Kiffin said this before his team went and laid an egg in Gainesville and before Texas A&M lost at Auburn because then it was absolutely a valid point. You had all these teams, two loss SEC teams that, yeah, you can say, all right, well, if you take a third loss in the SEC championship game, you know, it, it, it could work against you. Now, I think it's a free roll. Anybody that gets into the conference championship game outside uh, uh, in, in the in the two major conferences in the SEC and in the in the Big uh, Ten is already in, as far as I'm concerned, in the CFP. So if Penn State gets it, that's a free roll against Ohio State. Yeah, the remedy is just going to be what they're going to do, and they're going to add more teams. Well, so uh, the same thing like Texas. You know, what if Texas loses? And again, here's something also to keep in mind. There's a lot of money for these conferences here. If A&M beats Texas, there's a team that gets in that was not going to get in. Texas will be in, and maybe one or two, and one or two others. Georgia will be in. So if A&M well, Texas, loses, A&M won't be in. If they no, if they if they beat Texas in the championship no. game. Oh, in oh the, I'm sorry, if, in the championship game, assuming they beat Texas, yes. Yeah, Texas A&M would have to win the championship game. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing again, right there. If Texas A&M plays in the SEC championship game and loses, they're out. They don't go to the playoffs, but say, but the team that doesn't get into the SEC championship game, Tennessee, say, does make the playoffs. <laughs> How yeah, ridiculous it, is that? That is ridiculous, but it's it's a stronger regular season resume, though, Greg. In, in, in that regard, I know. Yeah, I, 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 I would have the beef if I'm A&M against Alabama because then Alabama Alabama is basically the strongest three win three loss team and we're talking about them potentially sliding in somehow Th- then I would have that beef if I'm a and I all my third loss comes in the thing and I beat Texas so from that standpoint I think you, you put those two head to head and I would have a and in but based on the exact points you're making I, I think it would be ridiculous otherwise yeah, that that uh, loss to Notre Dame may have been the strongest. In fact, you said you sent something out over the weekend, Greg, and I didn't get a chance to to give you a reply because I did some research about the SEC and how they've done in non-conference games. But I'd have to say that uh, that uh, A and M's loss, home loss to Notre Dame at the start of the season, was the best. It may have been the only non-conference loss by an SEC team. Yeah, which, which again uh, goes to scheduling. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Can't wait. It's uh, real, We're all looking forward to it. We got one more big week, though. And then, of course, championship week. So there's still a lot to be determined. Um, and uh, I, look, we're going to talk about the Texas-Texas A&M game. And again, we just talked about it a little bit. So Texas A&M, their only chance to get to the playoffs. They've got to win out. They've got to beat Texas. And then they got to beat Georgia. So... Uh, Look, I, I think I think the hard part is definitely going to be in my in my mind. It's this week. I think if Texas A&M beats Texas, I see no reason in the world to think that they can't beat Georgia. So I think that's more than possible. But the question is, can they beat Texas? They're a five point dog, I believe. I'm not sure if that number has changed. Uh, they're about almost a two to one on the money line. Uh, statistically speaking, Texas is a much better team than Texas A&M, but uh, they don't play the game on stats, and it's going to be a madhouse. Uh, uh, at, you know, at, you know, at, at this venue, uh, there the, the 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 ticket prices, the average ticket prices for this game are the largest <laughs> average ticket prices for a football game ever. Not sure, it's, I think it's over a thousand dollars the average ticket price. Uh, so it's going to be a madhouse. It's a night game. Um, what well, excuse think, me, one Andy? second, Greg. Greg, maybe you know the answer because I didn't get a chance to look it up. Is this the first time that they are meeting since A and M left the conference to go yep. to the SEC? Yep. Yeah, they haven't yep. played since uh, uh, oh, uh, nine, 2011. Twenty, yeah, 2011. You know, guys, the, uh, they played every year from 1915 to 2011. Yeah, A and M and Texas and played often each it was other a- for 96 consecutive years. And right now they haven't played her 14 and, or 15 And often years. it was a Thanksgiving Day game. Right. It certainly was. Uh, I, I, I got to mention something because I hear, I, I believe Jim's dog barking in the background. And <laughs> it, 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 guys, it reminds me, you know. That, uh, means, that means we have to play dogs all weekend. No, no. Yeah, that, we're going to talk that about dogs. That was his dogs. opinion on A&M. We're going to talk about <laughs> dogs points. right now. You know, um, uh, Tony mentioned the carnage 
in in the um, SEC conference that trio of road upsets. It shook up the SEC playoff picture big time last week. Alabama slid what six spots after that stunning twenty-four to three loss to Oklahoma. Uh, Ole Miss, <laughs> uh, double-digit road favorite, they dropped five spots after falling by seven to Florida. Of course, wow. A and A and M uh, dropped five spots after that loss to Auburn. And by, and by uh, the way, college football, get rid of that stupid two-point conversion rule after only two <laughs> overtime positions. You, you, you want to do it, it? Let at least four or five regular, and it's not even a regular position. You're starting from the 25-yard line, but at least let them play more than two overtime periods. And in I fact, know. even even go into the third overtime before you make them go for two. You know, it's, right. Uh, uh, credit mark on his play. That was his 10-star uh, college football game of the year. Auburn last week against A and M, thinking maybe A yeah, and M's got to look ahead. Watching that game, going, I knew it all the time. Right, it was twenty-one nothing <laughs> at one point. Uh, Auburn, uh, it got of course very very dicey. It went into those multiple overtime periods. Uh, regardless of how it happened or how he got it done, give Mark credit for that uh, ten star game of the year winner. But guys, this conference, the SEC, has been all about the dogs all season long. Yeah. Particularly in conference play. Here's the numbers from the database. Underdogs in SEC conference play are now 40 and 18 against the spread this season. That's 69%. Wow. Just flat out underdogs in the SEC conference. Even better on the road, 21 and 6 ATS. But anyway, since I heard Jim's dog barking, I had to mention the great, great numbers uh, for the underdogs in this conference this year. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, keep, keep it going because I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna take Kentucky. I'm gonna actually, that's not a, even though they are an SEC home dog, but not, not in an SEC matchup, but still, they're an SEC team as a home dog. I'm gonna take Kentucky South Carolina. Don't want to win that game. <laughs> What's that? I said Kentucky fans don't want to win that game, and it's aided Louisville. We'd rather Mark Stoops be gone. And by the way, the team that I know we haven't talked a lot about, they still have a chance, is South Carolina. And sure. South Carolina is now in place. They're 15th in the rankings. A few things can happen and go their way. I mean, they're playing such great football. They get another big win on their resume if they beat Clemson. And by the way, speaking of the two-point conversion, it came into play twice this year, big time in the SEC. Because South Carolina missed that two-point conversion to tie Alabama in that game yep. earlier this year. Yep. That had if, if they get that and beat Alabama, maybe South Carolina is sitting here right now in the playoff picture. And then what happened last week with Texas A&M. So the two-point conversion attempt, um, uh, or I should say just, yeah, it not one was not overtime, but the other was. But the bottom line is just a two-point conversion attempt uh, just uh, played a big role in the SEC uh, this well, season. All right. One quick Don't note on South Carolina, though, and that, that you mentioned it, the Alabama game, that's that's going to be the toughie for them to overcome because uh, Alabama was coming off the Vandy loss. South Carolina took them to the limit uh, and uh, and did not get that two-point conversion. So if you put those two head-to-head -head as three loss teams, even though South Carolina is hotter, I would personally put the head-to-head -head, uh, and, and favor the tide on that. And I, I know I, Alabama I, gets the I home game. Can get in there. there are a lot of SEC people who are, are – are fans across the country who are rooting for Auburn this week to pull the upset and end right. that and any conversation about Alabama. And they might. Yeah. So that's another dog. Um, who do you like in the game, Tony? Which, which one, Auburn, Alabama or? No, Texas, Texas A&M. Oh, Texas, Texas A&M. I, I, I just think uh, Texas is a little too deep. Um, but I could see A&M winning, obviously being at home helps uh, and, and, We'll see if yours yours is, is like the ultimate uh, rhythm quarterback. So if if he can get into a rhythm, I think they win that game going away. Uh, A&M has lost basically two of the top three running backs. So it's just that kid Amari Daniels, who's very good, maybe getting 25, 30 carries. I think if they were able to split carries, that would be much better. And then they've lost a couple of receivers as well. Marcel Reed, not really much of a thrower. So uh, I think Texas – should win that game, but uh, I, I could see AM will be upset. All right. Anybody else have anything on the Texas, Texas AM game before we yeah. move uh, over to the NFL? Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, Texas, you wonder what they're going to do. They're going to be in regardless of whether they make the championship game or not. Yeah. Yeah. And there'll be a deep, well, where are they seated right now? Like fifth or fourth? Well, they got the bye. I think they're yeah. second. 
Okay, second. So, you know, if they lose to A&M, they can't play in the championship game because the loser's automatically uh, out. So yeah. they'd still have uh, – uh, they'd be, what, 10-2, uh, and two, okay? And uh, the losses would have been to uh, Georgia – and a decent A&M team. So I would think that uh, if Texas were to lose this game, they're not really hurt. Maybe they don't get the bye. Maybe they do. It depends what happens in some of these other games and championship games. Uh, meanwhile, it gives A&M a, a better opportunity to perhaps throw out a team like an Alabama or something like that. If they, Because if they get a chance to win the championship game, they would take over a bid that would would most likely have gone to another SEC team. And well, what about Georgia? No, Georgia's in. Well, Georgia, all right, but but if they beat, you know what I'm saying, but if they beat Georgia and that gives Georgia another loss, yeah, that's different than Texas's two losses and Georgia's three. Don't you think Georgia probably, maybe, maybe they're not even in. Maybe Texas A&M is just replacing Georgia. Yeah, it's possible. Well, well yeah, because I guess we also have to think about Tennessee. Yeah. And where they, I mean, where they would stand up with not playing in the championship game. So. As long as they don't get upset by Vandy. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I mean, isn't the line pretty much the same with uh, Vandy and Tennessee as it is with Auburn, Alabama? Aren't they both about? Uh, it's a little lower. I think it's eight and a half. Yeah, that seems a little short. Well, Vandy's been covering an awful yeah. lot. So, well, they they were in the first half of the season. And they did last week, I guess. What was it against LSU? I think they got a yeah a score late to yeah. Pavia has game. not been one hundred percent. I think that's yeah. right. He's just been beat up the whole year. And it's, I, it's I do like A and M. I do like A and M against uh, okay uh, against Texas. You know, uh, it's a rivalry. Yep. I think um, you know Texas probably Texas might harbor a little bit more ill will because A and M was the first team to uh, you know he was the one who broke up the Texas A and M. Texas rivalry. You know, I don't think those kids 15 care. years ago. Yeah, I, I don't care <laughs> either. But uh, I give A and M a, a, a shot. I'd like to, I'd like to see the line go up a little bit, and if it can hit six and a half, even six, I'll be on uh, I'll be on the Aggies. Okay. All right. So that is our college football segment, and uh, Jim is uh, frothing at the at the mouth, waiting to get in here to talk <laughs> some NFL. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm reading. I'm reading some stuff. I really I can't believe here. I, I I'm reading that Daniel Jones is signing with the Vikings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course he is. Sam Darnold signed there. He's an ex-Jet cast. And he's he's going to be Jones. on the practice squad, I think, for a week or two before they activate him, and then he will be Darnold's backup, I believe. You want that? There, there's a relationship. Action. What's that? He wants that KOC development. Yeah, well, they're, they're, right, there's a connection right. there from the past. He actually should play for free because it was the Vikings and the Giants win in the playoffs over the Vikings that got Daniel Jones his bag of money a couple of years ago, <laughs> right? <laughs> you mean he's going to want to give some of that money back? Right yeah, there? Who knows? <laughs> hey, he's going to sign, sign a one-year deal. The agent uh, would like it. Both Darnold, there's a good chance both Darnold and Jones will be on a different NFL team next year, or one of them perhaps backing up uh, when uh, uh, the rookie quarterback from Michigan, McCarthy, is healthy as well. But uh, they both stand to uh, uh, get some significant playing time in the NFL. Their careers are not over. I would have liked to have seen him end up, uh, Jones end up with Miami to back up Tua because with Tua, mm -hmm. Dolphins have a very realistic chance at making a run to at least get a wild card. Without Tua, virtually no hope. They totally botched their backup quarterback situation for the yes. year the Dolphins did way back what in the happened? Uh, what happened to Mike summer. White? Uh, what he, happened to Mike White? They let him go. They thought that uh, <laughs> the, the kid from yeah. Kansas State uh, was better uh, and cheaper. Oh. Uh, Skyler Thompson. <laughs> that was probably that. a money move, and it was a wrong move. Yep. Yeah. Well, one team that is chasing the Dolphins in the AFC playoff picture is the Cincinnati Bengals, and they host Pittsburgh. They're coming off the bye. So if any team that was a – you know, they're still a playoff contender and therefore a championship contender because we know how talented they are. So if any team needed a kind of a, a restart, a refresh – uh, where they can just sit back and then understand that we're just a few plays here or there from being three games over 500 instead of three games under 500. It's the Cincinnati Bengals. they got to fix their defense. And I am going to talk to John Sheeran actually a little bit later on. You can catch that video on the Arleds football channel. Uh, we'll have it over on ProLine 2. Um, but the fact is, is that the defense has just been a mystery. The last couple of years, uh, the coordinator they like, 
So I don't think there's anything there that they're going to be firing him. Uh, so something has gone wrong with that defense because the offense can only do so much, Jim. But as we talked about a couple of days ago on the show that we have uh, available here on the channel, you can check it out. We'll have a link in the description. Uh, we went over the fact that if the Bengals can just win this first game out of the bye, their next three games are all games in which they'll be favored. Dallas, Tennessee, Cleveland, meaning they could put a four-game winning streak right out of the bye and get right back into this, but they have to start off with a win over Pittsburgh on Sunday. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal for if Miami were to lose this week on Thursday. Uh, that really helps the Bengals. It could light a fire under them because that opens up a potential spot for them. Well, Denver's in uh, in seventh, but Miami is the uh, the team that is the eighth team right below Denver. Correct. But some he's got they got to jump both of them anyway. So yep, getting one out of the way on Thursday yep. would be a big. And of course, Miami is playing in conditions that are really not conducive to them. I mean, it, the wind chill factor might be zero there, and that is not Miami weather. No, but they, they do they do catch a break. It's not going to snow. Uh, we'll, 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 see sure. we'll see for sure if uh, you know come kickoff because it is Green Bay. But the forecast is no snow, light winds. So from that standpoint, they catch a break. But I I, I love too his response to it as they asked him about it, and he said. Uh, we love it. We love the fact we're going to Green Bay. It's time to dispel all narratives. Just great. And by play. the way, it's the <laughs> light. It's the light winds that may be the most significant factor there for Miami that helps. Exactly. Exactly. And it, the, the fact that it, they're not gusting 25, 30 miles an hour really helps. It, yeah, was, for for the Dolphins, though, uh, they can psychologically say whatever they want. It's still going to be freaking yeah. cold. And they, you know, to... the other side of it is Green Bay's not too bad. I mean, they can play. Exactly. <laughs> Green Bay actually might – I think Green Bay is better than Miami. So they got to go to a better team's venue in a weather condition situation they're not used to. Uh, and it's only three and a half, right? The point spread, I believe. I don't even, I don't even know I if the hook is there anymore. I, well, I, I think I it's down three. three. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I think it's three. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised. Well, Lo Love is not having the kind of second half season so far this year that he had last year, but he's still no, uh, fairly, no. fairly capable. Fairly, By the way, early in the second half. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, two thirds of the way through the season. So I guess we're three. He, games reminds, the he reminds half. me yeah. a little bit of Jameis Winston, the way he's careless with the ball. He's all the capability yeah. in the world, big arm, every, everything. But then he does some crazy things, you know, that's, uh, Levis, Wilson, Love, they, they're a little a little crazy with the ball sometimes. If there uh, is, you know, guys, one day that in which you're going to be laying the points, uh, Turkey Day is the day to do it. Uh, really? Favorites have gone 69% against the spread, dating all the way back to 2005. Favorites on Thanksgiving. Uh, so it is a day in which uh, – a lot of the sharps are kind of aligned with the public in laying the points. If you eliminate Dallas from those favorite lists, because Dallas has actually gone two and eleven ATS their last no. Thanksgiving Day games, no. Dallas. The numbers are even higher. The non-Dallas Turkey Day favorites are somewhere around twenty-five and four ATS last twenty-nine games. And, and, and by the so way, it that goes really, well for Detroit that, I was and then say, Green it, Bay in the night game. It does not include Detroit for the most part because Detroit's rarely been favored on Thanksgiving. Yeah, However, right. last the year, they were, they were up. Yeah. The, right. Yeah. They were the turkeys it's instead of the lions reason, yeah. on Turkey City because <laughs> they were served up to the opponent. But last year, <laughs> that was the game that uh, they lost at home uh, to Green Bay. Uh, on right. Thanksgiving, and one opportunity. So I think that that's a little added motivation for uh, the Lions tomorrow. Not only not only that, they got uh, nine and two Minnesota and nine and two Philadelphia right on their backs. So they want to keep that one game lead for that number one seed. But you know, getting back to that Cincinnati game, you mentioned something, Greg, and it's very important. Those next three games uh, at Dallas, at Tennessee, and against uh, Cleveland, they might be very well favored in that game uh, at uh, at Dallas. Certainly at Tennessee and Cleveland, you would think as well. They could, and, and so if they win, uh, this is a game I wrote up in, in my newsletter this week on on uh, Cincinnati. Basically, they're all in. 
This is their. This is basically their season because if they win, if they lose this game, they'll have eight losses. They'd have to win out just to have a chance at a tiebreaker at nine and eight. If they win this game and then do what's expected the next four weeks, all of a sudden they are eight and seven, chance to uh, to get ten and seven. Okay, eight and seven entering week sixteen. I'm sorry, week seventeen. And you know who they finish the season with? Because you mentioned this before, they host Denver. That could be a huge game in week 17. And then they end the uh, season with the uh, rematch at Pittsburgh. And who knows, Pittsburgh might be resting players uh, if they're not the uh, number one seed that has a bye coming up. So they may have to play the following week. So the path for Cincinnati to make the playoffs is very realistic, but it basically ends if they lose to, if they lose this game. Yeah. And by, and by the way, they catch Pittsburgh for whatever it's worth in a Cleveland sandwich, having uh, lost at Cleveland last week and playing Cleveland again next week after this game against the Bengals. Right. It's a, it's a four division game in a row stretch for the Steelers. They did not play a division yep. game in the yep. first two months of the season. So they're in the midst now of basically a four game division uh, gauntlet, the Steelers. Uh, since this is our, our, our NFL game guys, uh, I've got conflicting numbers when it comes to the total uh, open 47. It's like up to 48 now. Uh, I'll say this. This is the highest over underline in the Cincinnati Pittsburgh series in the last 12 meetings. The highest line prior to this was 49 and a half dating all the way back to the 2018 season. Um, two and six over under last nine played in Cincinnati, slightly toward the under in each of the last three seasons. The first meeting between these two has gone under, while the second meeting has gone over, if that means anything at all to you. Uh, Pittsburgh, 6-5 and five over under on the season, only 39.8 points per game. Their first two road games started the year 0-2 over under. Not surprising. What is, is that in each of their last four road games have gone over the total, rare for the Steelers, who's been one of the more uh, consistent road under teams over the last, oh, five, six, seven seasons. Cincinnati, you know what you're getting. Uh, killer offense, lousy defense. No wonder they're eight and three over under on the season. And the average Cincinnati game has seen 53.9 points per game. But that's nothing. In the last month of play, Cincinnati games have averaged 62.2 points per game. Um, again, I've got conflicting numbers. Uh, since late in the 22 season, AFC North division games in which the home team is favored, like this one, have gone eight and one. That's eight overs, one under in the last two, two and a half seasons. But with that said, uh, we're on a four-year pattern now where teams who come in off their bye in the NFL have been very strong under plays. 69% under the total in the last four years for all NFL teams off their bye week like Cincinnati. So that's why I have conflicting numbers. I'm not touching the total. There's good numbers on one side. There's good numbers on the under uh, in terms of the other side. I think there's better totals out there, but it's got me a little discombobulated when it comes to the total this week. I don't know if it's going to be low scoring like that Pittsburgh Baltimore Ravens game was the other uh, week in which the over under line was 50, or if it's going to be like the last uh, month of play for Cincinnati games which have seen 60 or more points per game. Yeah, it's possible with the buy. That's the one thing you don't know what's going to yeah. happen, especially when the Bengals are have to figure this defense out. So if if they all of a sudden come out of this and, and game in this buy and 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 the, the game is over, we see like a 2017 game, well, maybe they fix something. Maybe this is the beginning cuz Cincinnati cannot get back to the playoff picture without their defense playing better. They just can't. Yeah, it, so, al- it almost—I was going to say—it almost seems like if you like Pittsburgh in this game, you like the over because you figure that Pittsburgh will be able to do to Cincinnati's defense what every other team's been able to do to Cincinnati's defense. On the other hand, if you like Cincinnati, you almost might make a case for the under because for this game to stay under, Cincinnati's defense basically has to play yeah. well, pretty much unlike it's played for most of the season. Although it has shown some improvement. Uh, in the in recent weeks compared to the first compared to a week's two through whatever after that first uh, week against New England when they the uh, the Ravens the Ravens have a similarly bad defense and we saw what happened in that Ravens Steelers game the Steelers did drive the ball but they slowed down on offense in the red zone 
had to result to what? Five field goals in that game? They couldn't punch it in the end zone? I think it was 15-14. Or, oh, no, it was 18-15, something like that. But in a similarly bad defense, they still couldn't punch it in the end zone, the Steelers, uh, against the Ravens. The Chargers, the Chargers the other night scored 23 points. Uh, Quinton Johnson dropped the ball three times, and their running back got hurt, the best running back the Chargers have. And and it was still, the game went over the over the total. I mean, they scored 53. The, I mean, the, funny thing, the, second uh, half, uh, the funny thing about the second half was that the number was 26, and they scored exactly 26. Yes, they did. So, so with, whether you bet it over or under in the second half, you would have just pushed. Which is a very but, odd number to hit for a half or for a full game, 26. You got yes, that right. Very often. It really is. I was, I was on the. Uh, I was on. I, I, in fact, I gave it out on the show on the on the short. I was on. I said, uh, uh, Jim Harbaugh will finally have the uh, a lead on his brother, and was looking great until John Harbaugh had that gamble. A ridiculous. Oh, that was gamble. big. That was that a big off. gamble. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm on. I'm on uh, Baltimore. Uh, pardon me, the Chargers plus one and a half first half. And uh, so fall behind there, and they got the the Dicker field goal right at the uh, at the halftime buzzer to go down by one. So won that bet, and then I was on the full game under, which again penalty aided in that final yes, drive. Yes, it was. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, there there were two pass interference calls. One I bought. One the the other one that, that er, the earliest one that extended the drive was absolutely not pass interference. It's just let's extend the game for. No reason, and obviously got to better for TV. Those, it's better for TV ratings. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's why those those plays should be reviewable. I mean, why should there be any exception? Absolutely. You heard the one about that Viking Bears game, and the explanation was that they couldn't review that if uh, Addison went out of bounds because of the camera angle, and not every stadium has that camera angle. Come on, NFL, either get rid of that rule or make every every. Uh, uh, stadium be uniform as far as where the cameras are placed because that was an obvious out of bounds play, didn't it? The result I don't think hurt because I think they ended up getting a field goal that they like would have gotten anyway. But uh, you know the NFL needs to do some real thinking about some of the rules that make very little sense and especially why should you know officials have too much control over the game. And the NFL has always been interested in integrity. Well, if you're going to review some plays, you should review all plays, either a pen, an obviously pen, obvious penalty that wasn't called or an obviously non-penalty that was called. Because at some I, point, I, I, that's I've going to become a bigger in, issue. Long been in the camp that PI should be challengeable or reviewable. You said that the NFL's interested in integrity. The first priority of the NFL is money. Yeah. That's integrity, and integrity might could come hurt. down the list somewhere, yeah. but money is number one. Well, integrity could hurt the money, which and they and they have the ability to do away with integrity being that blatant of an issue. And in fact, to Tony's point, if you want it, if you want to do it, PI should be a ten yard or a fifteen yard penalty rather than a spot of the foul if it's a fifty yard gain. Yep. Uh, Pittsburgh, by the way, the, uh, third road game in four weeks. Uh, so there's that. Uh, they swept Cincinnati last year. 2-0, straight up and against the spread in the road dog role this year are the Steelers. They beat Atlanta and Washington on the road. Cincinnati, 6-0-1 against the spread in their last seven as a home favorite of 10 or less when they are in a revenge situation. Double revenge, actually, uh, in this one. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a crazy – I mean, you have the offense on one side and the defense on the other side. It's really – it's a very – I mean, I know that – it, it's very hard to analyze that game. I like the Bengals, but damn, can they stop anybody? Yeah, it's, it's strength against strength and weakness against yeah. weakness. Although, right, I think since, although Cincinnati's defensive yeah. weakness is weaker than Pittsburgh's offensive weakness. Yeah. I'll tell you what, let's do a, a quick Thanksgiving segment. Uh, maybe I'll uh, post this as a separate video. I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask Victor I not, about Dallas. On. Can I ask Victor Dallas? You mentioned Dallas doesn't cover on Thanksgiving, but everybody else does if they're favored at home. If they're now, favored. What, what is going on with the Gi the Giants? we got to look at the other side of this game. The Giants look like they actually went into tank mode by get, getting rid of Jones, starting Tommy DeVito. Now, what the, I mean, what are they going to do with quarterback this week? Are they going to start Luck or DeVito? It looks like Luck, luck is going to start. Uh, when the Giants flew out to Dallas today, this morning on Wednesday, DeVito did not make the flight. Now, they said that he will make a later flight, 
but the speculation right after that tweet came out was indeed that the uh, that Drew Locke is probably going to get the start uh, for the GM tomorrow against Cooper Rush. When I'm looking at the line and I don't see any movement on right. this, I mean, if Locke <laughs> there, starts, there shouldn't be. When, right. I mean, it, all, it almost it almost Locke tells is me better than Devito. Well, I, I, no, may, I, I definitely agree maybe with not. That. No, I'll tell you why. I definitely agree with because, that, but I, I'll, I'll tell you why it may not be that way. Because the Giants have a better chance of losing with Locke. They're they're fighting with Dallas for potentially the number one draft choice. So if the Giants are really trying to lose, start your weaker quarterback against uh, against the Cowboys. Um, Remember, play, players don't tank. It's coaches no. and management well, that but, put but, them in okay. position to tank, it's, it's, and that's what exactly. we're doing here. But but it's obvious when you make the move for Daniel Jones now, no matter how bad he's been playing, he's still better than these guys. Um, absolutely. All oh, right, absolutely. So, no question. So Dallas, you, you mentioned the, uh, the 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 odds against them in this spot, but how about this? They're twenty five and four against the spread in their last twenty nine when they were division favorite of two or more. Twenty five and four. Now, got to preface this though they've only been in this situation once this year and they lost because they played the new york giants earlier this year they were a six-point favorite and they won by five and that was on so the road they're on an zero and one streak but they're still 25 and four in the last 29 as they, they also played. have they also have won a home game this year right no, and how many have. how many of those uh, 29 games were with dak prescott a quarterback probably <laughs> all of them so uh, that obviously is a big deal. Uh, they have also won seven straight against the Giants, covering five of the last seven. And they've covered 13 straight as a favorite of two or more off of a division game when they take on a losing team. All of this, of course, is thanks to the Playbook magazine <laughs> that you can purchase uh, from Mark Lawrence of Playbook Experts, PlaybookSports.com. We'll have a link oh, in the but, description for that. And by the way, the line has moved in favor of Dallas. I don't know what it did uh, uh, after Victor's uh, announcement of, of the quarterback thing this morning, but the game opened two and a half. I saw it get as high as four the other day. Yes, four now. Giants 0-6, straight up ATS last six. Chicago, Detroit, guys, quick thoughts on that. The Bears have lost five straight since the bye. And by the way, if you look at their schedule, it might be one of the toughest last six game schedules at all in the NFL. So they're in a lot of trouble. 10, 22, and 1 against the spread. Their last 33 as a road dog are the Chicago Bears. And they take on a red-hot Lions team. That's won nine straight and covered eight out of nine. What do you think about this one? Is I, 10 points too much to give or no way? Detroit's too hot. you got to take the Lions on Thanksgiving. It, it might be too much to give for the first half. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I said last week, yeah. I thought that line of seven <laughs> was fishy because it seemed way too low. This is a team that in their, uh, what, nine previous wins had averaged winning by like 16, 17 points per game. They won this one by by 18. I ended up making a play on uh, on the Lions anyway, just out of, uh, out of principle. I could see the same thing here. You know, the Bears have been very interesting. They showed signs of promise early. Caleb Williams showed some, uh, some, some improvement. And then they had that bye week that I think followed that Washington Hail Mary loss, if I remember correctly. They haven't won since, and the play has declined both from the team's perspective and from the uh, quarterback's perspective. He put a well, pitch actually, it's gotten week. better the last couple of weeks. Yeah, the, the last couple of weeks it has. But yeah. I also wonder how much. Uh, offensively. Yeah. Yeah, the, how, how, much, how deflating that uh, loss to Green Bay was a couple of weeks ago because I was also looking at that schedule. It may, it may be one of the toughest schedules in NFL history for the last six games going forward. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I may end up playing uh, Detroit in the, uh, in yeah. the contest as well as out of pocket this week. Yeah. You either stay away from the game or take Detroit. Especially, well, yeah, especially yeah, remembering I, last year. Again, it's one of those days where uh, public and Sharps might uh, meet together in regards to this game. I already bet Detroit minus six and a half in the first half. I've already played my Detroit uh, minus 10 in the game. Uh, still considering the Packers laying off the favorite in the Dallas game, but I'm with an agreement with you guys. It's it's one of those uh, games where you, you lay it or don't play it. Now, if you to mention, Greg, you said you see Dallas four. Where do you see that? Because I'm looking at 11 lines that I play in different places, and every one of them's – Three, three or three and a half with the with the uh, Giants minus money at three and a half. 
Well, the four so that I, I don't see four anywhere. The four that I got was uh, yesterday, I believe, and it was on Draft Sharks, which is not a yeah. sports book. Okay. Fours and were wonder, available yesterday at the Superbook. Yes, for a couple hours. And I, I wonder if that if they it, move it three, down. Three and a half now, right? and that's the weird thing, Tony. It, there was fours available yesterday, and there's virtually none today. And they've decided that it's probably going to be Drew Locke. What, what does that tell you? It's a weird. That's a weird move. Yeah. That's that's crazy. I'll, I mean, I'll give out my stuff. I, I actually like the over in Chicago, Detroit. Just that uh, Caleb Williams looks more uh, confident uh, I, with Thomas totally, Brown as they OC. And, totally but, agree. But, but, but keep keep in mind, you got to you got to monitor two things. David Montgomery, legitimately questionable. Yep. You love him in the red zone. Seems like an automatic touchdown inside the five. And uh, St. Brown is questionable, but he told everybody he's going to play. So, and the line has come down to nine and a half in uh, 10 of the 11 places I'm looking at. Yeah, it's definitely down from the opener and, and now single digits everywhere. Yeah. But yeah, and totals come down too. So down to 47 and a half, 48. Uh, and, thing. Go ahead, go ahead, Tony. Uh, just ra- wrap it up. What I like, uh, Giants Dallas. I actually like player props here. I think Malik Neighbors gets forced out of the ball. Wouldn't have mattered if it's Devito or Locke. He he obviously chirped about not getting the ball when they were down thirty. Right. I think they forced fed him the ball uh, to start the second half. So I think he, he uh, receptions, uh, receiving yards, props for him and C.D. Lamb, seventy-seven catches. Uh, and obviously makes that Dallas offense sputter, but go <laughs> anywhere it's going to go. Lamb will take it. One one thing I you know noticed. this is an unusual situation for Dallas. Normally they have like a twelve and five season, or they're, they're really good in the regular season. I mean they're right now they're pretty bad. They're not going anywhere. This is a very unusual situation, and I know the players. I have some people that are very close to this team. And the players are really pissed that everybody's really down on them, pissed off at them, and they have nothing to look forward to. There's no postseason for them. So you might get a little bit more of an effort from Dallas than you would otherwise. I I would agree. I I wanted to go back to that Chicago-Detroit game because I take a look at stats first half of the season versus second half of the season. So in this case, they've played 11 games, so I use games one through six and then games uh, 7 through 11, because uh, that would be once they play 12, it would be 7 through 12. Chicago's defense allowed, in the first half of the season, 292 yards per game. Over the last, f- uh, f- let's see, the last five games, it's up to 395 yards for those games. That's a difference of 103 yards drop-off between the first part of the season and the second part of the season. Conversely, Detroit's defense has actually improved by about 35 yards offensively and defensively. So that Bears defense, which had been holding them in there early, I think that decline, which sometimes isn't that obvious, but the numbers reflect that they've been giving up a lot of yards, and usually that means more big plays. And Detroit's not the team you want to give up a big play to. No. I did it. I did have a good interview with R.J. Ochoa, uh, bloggingtheboys.com, covers the Dallas Cowboys, uh, spoke about a lot of things regarding what's going on in Dallas uh, with Jerry Jones, with their head coach search, uh, with personnel. So uh, we'll have a link in the description for that. Uh, You can catch that again uh, either on the Orlads football uh, channel or uh, at ProLine TV. So check that out. Links again in the description. Uh, and then, um, you know, speaking of Dallas, let's keep this in mind. Bland uh, had been out all week, all year, uh, made his return last week, and that was a big deal at corner. See, we can say what we want about Mike McCarthy and no Dak Prescott, but the, the, the Dallas Cowboys have been a walking wounded this year. So it's kind of hard to really judge them um, completely. So they get they get their corner back. Parsons, of course, has been back for a couple of days. So, uh, I mean, for a couple of weeks. So, uh it's probably not a surprise they actually won a game uh, when they had two of the best defenders back, uh, which will be, of course, uh, the same thing on Thursday. The last game, quickly, I don't know if you guys, we talked a little bit about it before, Miami and Green Bay. The weather's going to be a big factor, of course, as we mentioned. Green Bay's won six of the last seven. Miami's won three of the last four. The Packers are only one and eight against the spread at home when they, when they are following a double-digit, straight-up uh, division win. And if you think about that, uh, that number, they're 0-2 in that spot this year. So 
Uh, that's uh, not looking good for the Packers, but it's such a low number at three that you would consider this, Jim, of course, one of those situations where if you like the Packers, you might as well just take the money line. Well, that, I've already done that. Um, <laughs> there the, you go. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, 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 you know, if this was not a weather issue, you really have a hard time with this. And these teams are very, very similar. I mean, they're, they're easily – a turnover or one mistake here, one thing, one play there could turn it. They're not that dissimilar, but having Miami having to go on the road to a, a cold climate, what they're just not used to, and Packers play in this kind of weather all the time, it just it that's that's why the the Packers. I mean, I'm looking at three minus nineteen, three minus twenty, three and a half. The Heritage has a three and a half. I mean, the. If anything, this thing's going to go to four. That's where it's leaning. Anyone else before we move on from the from uh, the Thanksgiving Day games? Uh, there, there's a prop play I like a lot. In addition to, uh, I agree with Jim uh, as far as the Packers go and the Dolphins' struggles in cold weather. But uh, a guy who's been balling lately is I'm playing Johnu Smith's over 42 yards receiving for the Dolphins. Green Bay ranks bottom five in DVOA against tight ends and against short passes. And they've only faced like three top 20 fantasy tight ends all season long, but they've allowed 42 or more receiving yards in over half their games to tight ends. Guys like uh, Colby Parkinson, Josh Wiley, Brenton Strange. Here you got a legit guy who's been balling in John U. Smith. Uh, he's caught 15 out of uh, 18 targets for 188 and three TDs in his last two games. He's suddenly a very serious weapon down here in Miami, uh, a team that's been far less explosive than they were last year. He's had 45 or more receiving yards in six of his last seven games. If you're looking for a good prop, pound some of those Jonu Smith over receiving props for uh, a Thursday night. And one, yeah, one other I, thing. I, I like the prop too. Uh, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go Christian Watson. Uh, and correlate that with the over in this game. Packers probably were going to be without Jair Alexander, their, their top corner. Yep. He was out against the 49ers. That's good news for uh, for the uh, Dolphins receivers and John U. Smith. But uh, also, again, if, if, if the weather's good, 48, I think it's, it's attainable. And I think Jordan Love is going to give Christian Watson a couple more opportunities to make plays downfield. He got everybody else involved. Right before the half against San Francisco, he, he gave uh, Watson two deep balls, one that Watson should have come down with in his sleep, uh, and Watson healthy again. Obviously, hamstrings has been have been an issue for him uh, any time that he's not productive. Look, if he if they get him up to speed, that's uh, that's a lot of receivers uh, that you can count on if you're Green Bay and Jordan Love. You know, one thing I wanted to mention about. Uh, uh, if, if you're interested in these kind of things with point spread situations uh, based on this year, teams coming off a game in which they covered as a home favorite, which is the case for Miami, and then they're on the road, very strong this year. A total of 21, 9, and 1. 12 and 6 is favored, but 9, 3, and 1 as an underdog. So that would point to Miami. But I would certainly mitigate that with the weather situations uh, that, uh, that are likely to be encountered. All right, before we jump on the uh, high five uh, shorts, uh, a couple of quick other notes. Uh, Tennessee, can they make it two upsets in a row? Washington has lost three straight, straight up and against the spread. They got a bye next week. Head coach Dan Quinn is 4-18 and 18 lifetime against the spread off a straight-up favored loss and 0-11 wow. against the spread off back-to-back -back losses. Lifetime. So that's bad news for Washington, Tennessee, looking for back-to-back -back upsets. And Wasn't then, that mostly with Atlanta when Quinn was oh, with I'm Atlanta? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then also uh, Tampa Bay's at Carolina. So that's another team uh, that is trying to make a run. We talked about Cincinnati and Miami in the, in the AFC. Tampa Bay is that hot potential hot team in the NFC because their schedule is pretty nice. Starting this week, Carolina actually started last week with the Giants. Uh, and Baker Mayfield, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this maybe on a, on a future show uh, because uh, if Baker keeps playing like this, I guess the question I'm going to ask and pose you guys is, is who's a better MVP candidate, Baker Mayfield or oh, I, 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 this This kid for me, Baker, has been incredible. I mean, yeah, they're not one of the better teams, but not yet. What, yeah. a, what a warrior this guy is. 
Yeah, he took a bath in the fountain of youth or something, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> he's, been, he's been unbelievable. And anybody could have got him. Anybody. I'd have to go. I'd have to go with Barkley simply because he's putting up numbers that we haven't seen running backs do uh, for uh, for quite some time. And uh, you know, it's easy. It's always easiest to give the MVP to a quarterback because they're going to put up some very gaudy numbers, and there are you know a dozen or so guys capable of doing that. You see very few running backs. I think who was it? Uh, was it Adrian Peterson? The last running back to win MVP, and that was over a decade ago. It's such a rare thing that we're seeing out of Saquon Barkley that if he continues, certainly you know, he didn't have to set the record that uh, Dickerson set, but if he can go uh, over 2,000 yards and he's on a pace to do that, I, I'll be at a 17-game versus 16-game season. Incredible. I think he has a strong consideration, especially if the Eagles end up with uh, the number one or number two seed. And uh, you know, unlike last year when they collapsed, they end up with maybe two, possibly three losses at most. Right, and if Baker is going to get serious cred, number one, Tampa is going to have to be a winning team. They're still yeah. under 500, and they'd have to be uh, make a playoff run as well. Yeah, that's so why I said. Been, I, I definitely agree with Greg in terms of uh, of how he's how he's played without Mike Mike Evans finally back. Yeah, without the God wins Mike out, Evans. right? Yeah. He's, he's now Atlanta, they're ch- Tampa Bay is chasing Atlanta, who puts absolute no pressure on the opposing quarterback. And Atlanta's playing the Chargers. Now, the short week for the Chargers, given that. The Chargers are a small favorite on the road, two, two and a half. I see one some places. But, I mean, that's going to give Herbert a lot of time to throw the ball. And that could be a – I mean, if Quinton Johnson can actually get his head out of his ass and catch the ball, that might make a difference. Well, uh, we talked about this also the other day, is that if Tampa Bay is going to catch Arizona, they've got to do it in the next two weeks because Atlanta has got two two games against teams that they could definitely lose to, and Tampa Bay has two more games against teams that they should definitely beat. But Tampa Bay could win, the, could win their division. Well, they're going to have to win their division. That's yeah. probably the way they're going to have to get in. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Uh, and remember, they've got to finish ahead of Atlanta because Atlanta's already swept them. But yeah, Atlanta won that game on a Thursday it. night that they shouldn't have it did uh, walk off touchdown. Okay, so uh, let's now get uh, set for our high five 60 second reports. So let me go ahead and get my little calculator here, my little stopwatch. And uh, <laughs> let's see who is going to go first. Who am I going to choose first? Uh oh. Let, let me choose Tony first. Tony, are you ready for your 60-second pick of the week? Sure, why not? All right, here we go. All right, let, let's ride Kansas to stay hot to beat Baylor. This is the Jeff Grimes revenge game. Grimes was scapegoated, I think rightfully, uh, for Baylor's struggles over the past few years when he was offensive coordinator there. Uh, he really struggled with Jalen Daniels this year, uh, but – Daniels has it going now. Devin Neal is, is playing really well. Kansas needs the game. Baylor uh, on a surge. Uh, but Dave Aranda has already gotten his uh, his uh, vote of confidence. So he'll be back in Waco. I think Kansas wins the game. And I'll get a bonus over 61 and a half. I think it's a nice little shootout. Uh, look for Kansas to get to six and six uh, as a, a road favorite. But bet the money line. All right. All right, fifteen seconds to spare, Tony. Who's who got a vote of confidence? The the OC? No, Dave Aranda. He's back Dave in. Dave Aranda. In the yeah. Oh, Dave Aranda. Oh, he, vote of confidence. I mean, they should have given him an extension. I mean, what a great job he did with the team this year, huh? And by well, the yeah, way, they, that that was the guy fell that off. they fell off after his first year. So I mean, there, there was like three straight years where they oh like, yeah lower expectations. But I mean. Yeah. No coincidence that they turned the table when he decided to take over the defensive coordinator position, the, the, the call on the plays, which was the whole reason they hired him in the first place. Yep, absolutely. And then, I mean, and again, like the, the offense has fallen off too, then this year it's better. And yeah. Brian yeah. leaving, I think, has a lot to do with that too. But the kid that they have at QB, Sawyer Robertson. Oh, Sawyer Robertson. Boy, he looked like crap last year. What a yeah. difference. It made, it made a ton of difference. Yeah. Yep. All right. Now let's uh, let's see who goes next. I am going to choose Jim. Are you oh, ready? Jim? do you I get the extra fifteen seconds that Tony didn't use? Uh, no, my Thanksgiving gift to him. Yeah, doesn't work that way. 
Are you ready? Uh, well, I'm going to go back to the. I'm going to go back to the game I just talked about. I'm going to go with the Chargers over Atlanta. I, I'm a Jim Harbaugh, big Jim Harbaugh fan, and I do believe that he has. He, he sent uh, Quentin Johnson to to wide receiver school this week, and he's got some Fred Blitnikoff. Uh, remember that guy with all the paste and tape and all the stuff that he put all over his body <laughs> so he can catch the football. Good old days. But without pressure on Herbert and that passing game. Uh, the Chargers are a big advantage, uh, coaching over coaching, and and and, and this uh, inability to get to the quarterback gives the Chargers a big advantage, and they have a lot to play for. And uh, Harbaugh, Harbaugh's a winning coach with a tremendous pedigree. Yes, it's his first year there. You can't expect a lot from, but he's going to get them up. They're going to play. Herbert's very very good, and he's very and he's actually pretty mobile too. Uh, he moves around pretty damn good. I like this team to win the game. And there's a reason it went from pick to two, two and a half. And a, a lot of sharp money came in on the Chargers. All right. Well, you went over, but there were like four spots where I could easily end it. So I'm okay. I'll edit that one. No problem. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, a few of those, the, you, you forgot you were in a short, but we got it. Editing, easy. <laughs> okay. Next up. Uh, let's go to Victor. Are you ready, Victor? Uh, yeah, go right ahead. Uh, we All can right. start this thing off, and we're going to talk about Baker Mayfield. We just talked about him. And Bryce Young, I like the way he's been playing. He's off a career game. But we're going to give the ball to Tuco this week, and Tuco went 2-0 and with his uh, first half totals last week, and he's playing the Bucks panthers over the total in the first half of their NFC South game this week, over 23 points. Bucks Panthers. It's the first meeting of the season between these two teams. You know what you're getting in Carolina? The undisputed kings of the first half overs. Their only under was in the London game against the Giants, seven to three at the half. Aside yeah. from that, they've gone ten and zero to the over in the first half this season. Carolina Panthers. On the flip side, Tampa Bay is no slouch when it comes to first halves, eight and three over under on the season. And in their last three division games this season, combined first half points for the Buccaneers in their division games, 41, 51, and 41. Bucks Panthers over 23 in the first half. All right. You only went about three or four seconds over. I could I could manage that. <laughs> we can live with that. I can figure it out. Uh Okay, so that is so that's the play over first 20. half Tampa Bay Carolina over twenty three. Yeah, and, and you mentioned Bryce Young, Victor, and the thing is this: look, I don't know if you, you, if you're not really just a fan, then you know you're not. If you're not thinking about or hoping that the kid can uh, find his game, uh, nobody wants to see a, a, a failure there, especially at the quarterback position. The NFL needs as many good quarterbacks they can get. I know it's only a small sample size, but this is why you have to give these kids time. You can't rush these kids because I do believe there's something there. That yeah, the kid will figure it out eventually. And I mean, he may never be a superstar, but he'll figure it out. Just you got to give these guys time. It's just, it's just, it was never, the game was never, they, they, you know, they never handled quarterback quarterbacks like this before. You never rushed them like this before. It doesn't work that way. So good luck to him. That's a good sign. I hope it continues. Okay. Last one's Andy. Ready, Andy? Give me about three seconds here. I'll start in a moment. Okay. One, two. No. All right. You just let, let, me, let us know when you're ready, Andy. And then he's going to wrap up our high five segment for the week. And then we'll have a few viewer comments and wrap it up for Thanksgiving and don't forget, if you haven't already subscribed to ProLine TV, the ProLine, the new ProLine TV YouTube channel, do that right now. Subscribe, like, and share. Uh, and again, uh, for the Playbook Experts channel, uh, keep in mind that uh, we're uh, getting close to 1,000 subscribers there. Uh, so there will be some videos on, on uh, different videos on both channels. So uh, we hope that you would subscribe to both. Uh, this way you don't miss a thing. Are you and ready? I am, I am all set. And I'm going to go back to a game that I think it was both you and Tony alluded to during our college football uh, discussion, and that's the game between Kentucky and uh, Louisville. In fact, I think uh, 
I think, Greg, you brought it up, and then Tony recorded it about the fact that they'll be rooting for Louisville in Kentucky because they want to get rid of Mark Stoops. And people just don't remember how good uh, Mark Stoops has been since he got get the rid of him. Compared, compared to, uh, well, that's what Tony said, that apparently they thought because uh, he had, but this was a horrible program before he got there. He's been there, what, a decade or so. Now, they have struggled in the last four seasons. They were five and six, ten and three, and then a pair of seven and six seasons. This year, they're four and seven, and it's going to end their uh, consecutive streak of eight straight bowl games. But look at Kentucky, who they've played. A one-point loss to Georgia, a close loss at Ole Miss. They've played a much tougher schedule than Louisville has, and Louisville has had difficulty holding on and playing well late in games. I'm going to be on Kentucky plus I think it's the three and a half and also on the money line as the Wildcats Wildcats win on Saturday. Oh, that was absolutely perfect. Right on the number, Andy. Awesome. Two, word, two words for you guys. John Summerall. That's why Kentucky's fan base wants uh wants Stoops gone. Summerall is an alum and Big donor. Uh, after leading Tulane to uh what he's done this season. He is going to be a hot commodity. Kentucky fans do not want this. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Well, look, if uh, all right, if you have a plan to get John Sumrall, I'll be okay with that. All right. <laughs> but outside of that. Well, like, I mean, they have money. you got to open up the, the basketball NIL. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but still, we, as Andy said, that was a nothing program for as long as I was born that I can recall. And he has been the most successful head coach they've ever had. Yeah, and, and they're never going to change from being a basketball program. So just let him do his thing and, and go to bowls and stop thinking about anything crazy like national championships and football in Kentucky. By very, the way. Very by similar to your neck of the woods, Greg, with Dave Doran. I mean, NC State fans want Dave Doran gone for the same reason, tired of plateauing. You know, uh, again, if you have an answer, okay. But this whole thing about let's just fire a guy and then figure it out because we're sick of plateauing. That's not the way to do it. But I'm all right. If you if you got a guy that's better than Dorn, then uh, let me think about it. But the guys was just like, I mean, come on. The guy's been also very good there. He's done a very good job. One of the things Dorn has did, he's like one of those coaches that's probably been a better recruiter than he has been a coach. His recruiting has been fantastic at that program. He has sent so many quality players to the pros, especially on defense. You know, when uh, Jim mentioned a few minutes ago about the NFL being all about money, pretty much the same thing in college football. And even though these guys haven't been there very long, the success they've had is unmistakable. And that's Singretti at Indiana and Dillingham at Arizona State. Yeah. I know they're just in their first and second years, but – uh, you know, if you're an SEC program, a major program, maybe even a, another Big Ten program, although I think it would, that would not be likely in the case of Singretti, but uh, then again, it might be, is that you throw, you know, you double the size of their current contract and you make it a five-year guaranteed contract, whatever it is, if either of those two guys might not be hot commodities. I think the answer is probably no, but I don't think it's out of the question. They are, they already extended Signetti. Mm -hmm. They, they wasted right, no time doing that. Yeah, uh, by of, the way, yeah, they threw a bag at him. And Dillingham <laughs> is, a, is a Phoenix kid. I guess he went to Arizona State. So they yeah. got a shot at keeping him. But they yeah. uh, they need to throw money at him. And and they should. I mean, Arizona State is is a should be a really good program, a really good destination. I mean, as if you're a kid at that level of your of your life growing up, and you're going on a recruiting trip to Arizona State. I mean, come on. You well, know, for years, it was, voted, it was voted the most hey, popular. 18 years old, party school in that school, school, not no, come on. All those girls Number one. There. Exactly. Yeah, come really, on. You don't I even mean, have to go to school. You just go there. <laughs> that's oh, all. Come on. Uh, by the way, that Kentucky-Louisville game that uh, Andy talked about, uh, the SEC dog, they're all, they've also won and covered the last five against Louisville, and yet yeah. they're the dog. And they're 14 and one against the spread in the last 15 non conference games since 2018, are the Wildcats. And they're 4 0 against the spread as a dog this year, including an Ole Miss upset, while Louisville is 2 10 and one against the spread as a road favorite since 2022. And they're 0 and 3 in that spot this year. So it's all saying Kentucky in Good the stuff. matchup with Louisville. Go Blue. All right, so let's now wrap up. I just want to, because uh, uh, I know we uh, kind of throw this in there at the end, uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, let's see. I'm going to throw in another one that uh, Tony's going to love from the Coffee Club Daily Emails. Uh, and this is, uh, let's see. 
There is a growing grumble around the NBA that the sport is suffering and TV ratings are tumbling because the math says players should fire up threes at a high rate, often at the expense of dunks and other more exciting basketball plays. Uh, what they're saying on opening night after the Celtics launched a jaw dropping 61 three pointers in a route over the Knicks, a respected sportscaster called for the league to change its rules. The NBA is at its best when dudes are flying over people, meeting them at the rim. That is when it's at its best television product. A bunch of finesse guys hanging out at the three point line, hoisting 30 footers is not good TV. And in the rise of desert games, this season, there have been 24 instances in which a team didn't score a single point in the mid-range area. For decades, we never saw one such game. Uh, how would you respond to that, Tony? I would say it's football season. I'm the, biggest, <laughs> I'm the biggest basketball guy in the world, and it's football season. I mean, the World Series was the Dodgers and the Yankees, and it's football season. So I might say something that, that that's that's basically my response to that. Okay. Once football <laughs> clears out, we'll have uh, the NBA and college basketball. It's going to be a great college basketball season based on what we've seen so far. Uh, yeah, I know, I know you guys follow baseball. Did you see the signing? The Dodgers? Is this the best Blake Snell baseball team ever? Yeah. I mean, I, geez. the one thing I didn't understand is how it's backloaded. Like it's deferred money somehow. Wow. But man, I mean, this team is just loaded. Probably got luxury yeah. tax implications. Yeah, the luxury tax yeah, ain't working. Yeah. They need yeah, a yeah, I mean, if, if they can keep Snell and Glass they, now healthy, the, Jesus. The and, bug, and, the bug, and, and the bug the I have with the with the NBA uh, is this damn this taking time off and not showing up and yeah. I mean, I I just absolutely hate that part. Yeah, no, it, oh. look, it's 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 terrible to handicap the NBA right now because of the, this injury report. You really do have to wait until thirty minutes before tip to get your stuff together. And I, I've fall. I've got two comments for the uh, NBA, Greg. The first is, um, fortunately, there's a plethora of college basketball games on every night to watch. <laughs> but more, but more to the point, move the three points to line back more than just a few inches. Why Make not? it a much more difficult shot. That would be nice, but you know they probably won't do that. They won't. I mean, why? But again, Tony, and again, we'll wrap up here. Uh, if that's the case, if 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 they're saying, or one of this one of these analysts is saying, it's a better TV product if they're not launching threes. Yep. Well, then why don't they do that? Why don't they? Every move? everybody's going to have a different opinion about. Well, do you think that is the the the? Uh, do you think more people feel that way or do you think that's just one opinion and it's it can go either way it could absolutely go either way i mean look a, a, a blast from the past jeff malone was a great mid-range player we, we don't richard hamilton was a great mid-range player we don't have a lot of those these days and if there's there's somebody that it, it emerges it, where that's their their uh value on the floor and they're not really a three-point shooter then they're going to take advantage of those strengths i mean at this point you you do grow up in in the game with analytics saying it's better to take a three pointer than a twenty footer. And, and also, a lot of us who are complaining about it are old. We don't know what the, <laughs> what, the what the feeling is amongst the target demographic male of what eighteen to thirty five or something. Yeah. They may love the way the game is being played right that, now. That, that's that's true. That is true. Yeah, they're, 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 they're tweaking the All Star format. We'll see if it works, and anything is an improvement <laughs> on the All Star. It's going to be uh, four teams uh, separated, and and they'll play pickup. So, so and I think and the, I think a lot of level like, will be ramped up. I think I'm like a lot of the players. I wasn't all that keen on that in season tournament. I love it now. Yeah, it, it, it helps. Yeah, it, it, it turned out to be a pretty time. damn good idea. Yeah, yeah, it really did. All right, that's going to wrap it up. So uh, I'll, I'll go around the corner uh, or go around the uh, the screen here to uh, uh, wrap it up individually. And uh, if you guys have any parting shots, Victor. Hey, we got our five-star NFL game of the month. Uh, it's an over. It goes on Sunday. We've got action at playbooksports.com on Thursday in the NFL, on Friday in college football, Saturday college football, and, of course, the aforementioned big one on Sunday. And you've got the newsletter, and uh, you also have uh, – what do you get? The dynamic duo package, too? Right, and don't forget totals, tip sheet. Hey, guys, on Thursday morning, it'll be 10 years exactly 
since I had my heart attack on Thanksgiving yeah. morning in 2014. No, no, no attacks since then. No repeats. No and I've repeats. gone from 240 pounds to 190. There you All go. Right. Wow. All right. That's and still moving. Man. Good man. Jim, so I, will not, I will not say happy. Well, first, and, first of and all, I want to say to everybody here, Mark included, even though he's not here this week, that happy Thanksgiving. I know we all have a lot to be thankful for. And, um, you know, we don't say that enough to each other. I know I appreciate what I have, and I know all of you. And I appreciate all of you. And it's been fun doing this show. And um, as far as games are concerned, I've been doing very well. Unless you count Monday and Thursday, which haven't been good. But, okay. but Saturdays and Sundays, the last two weeks, 17-3 and three and 11-6. and six. Mm. But Mondays and Thursdays have not been good for me. So I'm taking those days off for yeah. the rest of my life. No primetime games for Jim. <laughs> Andy? Yeah, I want to. Uh, I was going to say to uh, Victor, I didn't want to wish him happy anniversary, considering what it's the anniversary of. I'd rather wish him just happy <laughs> Thanksgiving. There you go. Uh, go today and you know, tomorrow and going forward, as I'd like to wish all of you uh, and uh, all of our viewers and listeners just a very happy Thanksgiving. Jim said it best. There's an awful lot, despite the day-to-day uh, -day tribulations that occur. We have an awful lot to be thankful for, living where we are, being mm -hmm. able to enjoy things the way we do, and uh, just feeling very good about things. And uh, looking forward to a very entertaining weekend. Looking forward to the final full season. All 134 FBS teams. It's the end of the regular season, except for one game, and that's a couple of weeks. In fact, it's the, I think the day of the first couple of bowl games, and that's the Army Navy game, which is all, which is America's true national uh, uh, national bowl game. So I'd like to wish everyone all the best this week and going forward. Let's hope we get snow in that game too. We, we need snow in the Army Navy game. Tony, just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Make some money from now to the end of uh, November. We got a couple of days to do that. Check out uh, all my work. Uh, that's my ex profile there by my name. So you can follow me there. You can see where all my picks and uh, articles are available at. And then, yeah, I, I really enjoy doing the show. So I appreciate all of you and uh, wish uh, thanks, happy Thanksgiving to you and your extended families. Yes, likewise, Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving to happy Thanksgiving to all of you and all of our viewers out there. We sure have come a long way uh, in this uh, second year. It feels like we've been doing this for four or five years, uh, but that uh, shows you how far we've come. Uh, and we still have a long way to go. Well, add, but, add up the hours, and it may be close to that. Yeah, probably. But you know what? That that shows our passion, that we really enjoy what we are doing. We enjoy sharing it and, and exchanging opinions, and it's really a lot of fun. Yep, and we're going to have a lot of fun in a few weeks with that first 12-team college football playoff uh, format coming out, then the NFL playoffs, and then after that, we're going to stay hot with the college basketball tournament, and then it just keeps going. We're not going anywhere this year, and that, that includes Playbook Expert's YouTube channel. Uh, we're moving on uh, uh, past college basketball into baseball season. We're even going to talk on, on ProLine TV about golf and NASCAR and horse racing and baseball. WNBA. And <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, well, yeah, Unrivaled, oh, baby. Yeah, WNBA yeah, and, That's yeah, cool. and much more. So, There's no uh, load management in WNBA. That's right. I like that. That's yeah. one thing to like. Oh, wait. i got to make sure that my cat, my little kitten, Oh, look at that. Get a little oh, air time. Nice. Sure. All yeah. right. She, she, what's, she what's, his, what, what's his she or her name? walk across the keyboard. So that I pick up my out. dog, but he's 85 pounds. I can't lift him. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're out of here. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We'll see you next week. Mark Lawrence returns. Best of luck, everyone.